Spring Church, let's stand together. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship with Harvard Avenue Christian Church. You may be seated. It's a joy to be here with you this morning. For those of you who are joining us online, and welcome to you as well. Please take note of the links below the worship cast. For those of you here in this space, I hope that you found yourself to one of our bulletins as well as the elements for communion. We'll partake of that later in our worship service. It is good and well that we join our hearts and our minds and our souls together in Christ, that we might worship a God who is loose in the world and doing great things. Let us worship together. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I hope that you have already found the worship email sent to you at 8 o'clock today so that you can have folks to pray for from within our congregation and news and information that you may want along the way. We're always so grateful for the ways that you share on those connection cards or through your emails or phone calls during the week so that we can be in prayer with you and for you. Today, especially, our prayer is focused on education, on our students and teachers and administrators and all of the ways that we learn in this world and the people who help us do that. As I pray today and focus on our children and our youth and college students and our educators, I hope that as we move through the prayer, you might picture or think of the names of the students and teachers in your life now or in the past, or maybe thinking of students and teachers to come so that we might more truly focus our hearts and minds on this prayer that we'll share together. Will you join me? Creator God, you have claimed us and called us your own, and for that we give you thanks and praise. We come with hearts full of gratitude for our model, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to live and how to move in this world, how to have our being in you. We give you thanks today for the opportunity even to pray, 
And we pray for all who are in need of healing and wholeness, of learning and teaching, for all of the ways that you bring our gifts together in this world. Gracious God, we pray for our children, for those in childcare and preschool, kindergarten and elementary students. When they are together here on Sunday mornings, they learn about the fruit of the Spirit, the ways that we show others what you look like. It's part of why we call our children's ministries the orchard, because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May each child remember that they are God's child. They are loved by Christ and strong in the Lord. May they know that their church friends are so proud of them and that we pray for them always. God, we pray blessing on these students for their health and safety, for their learning and growth, for their friends and their fun. Remind them that they are smart, strong, and loved. Gracious God, we pray for our middle school and high school youth and our college students. The world is bigger and different and more exciting and challenging the older you get. As we move through middle school and high school and college, more things pull at us to tell us what's important. May these youth and college students remember who they are and whose they are, remembering they're created by a loving God and given a mind and a heart and abilities to love others. Gracious God, we pray blessing on these students for their energy and adventure, for their learning and discovery, for their confidence and wonder. Cover them always with your grace and your love. Gracious God, we pray for our educators. They are teachers and assistants, principals and administrators, tutors and mentors, storytellers and shepherds. They bring their very best and their truest gifts every day, and we entrust them with our greatest gifts, too. They face tremendous challenge and exceeding joy. They take pride in their work and in each student's uniqueness. May they always know your love, God, surrounding them, going before them and behind. And most of all, may they be confident that you have already placed within them everything they need to accomplish all that their year will require. We pray and we pledge our support in every way we can, at every level we can. We are grateful for them and we send them into this year strengthened in prayer. Gracious God, we pray blessing on these educators, on all who do the hard work of educational leadership. Empower them through struggle and deepen their joy. God, you have called us and claimed us as your own, and you send us into the world, always learning who you have designed us to be. It is in the name and for the sake of the teacher we follow that we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven when you stroll down the golden avenue. There are mansions left and right, and you thrill to every side, and the saints are always smiling, saying, how do you do? Oh, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven when you realize you weren't dancing through. You'll be glad you were not idle, took time to read your Bible, it's a great, great morning for you. I had a dream, and I'll confess I hated to away. I dreamt I was an angel at the great pearly gate. St. Peter said, well, hello there. Where have you been? 
We've got your mansion ready, so come on in. And then he rang for an angel to act as a guide. He spread his wings a dive or two and learned how to fly. Oh, it's a great, great morning. You first stay in heaven when you stroll down the Golden Avenue. There are mansions left and right, and you're thrilled to every side. And the saints are always smiling, saying, how do you do? Oh, it's a great, great morning. Your first day in heaven when you realize your worry days are through. You would be glad you were not idle. Took time to read your Bible. It's a great morning, a great, great morning. What a happy day. Great, great morning, your first day in heaven when you realize your worry days are through. You're gonna be glad you were not idle. Took time to read your Bible. It's a great morning, a great, great morning. What a happy Usually, when there's a barbershop quartet, I always think it's over, but it's not over, and I stand up at the wrong time. <laughs> I was making sure it was really over. I I'm sad it was over. It was too short. But, but thank you, thank you, guys. Our gospel reading today comes from the middle of Mark's gospel. Chapter 8, verse 31. A little bit of context here. Jesus has called his disciples. They have spent a good deal of time with him. He has been traveling with them. And then he asked them, who am I to you? And Peter says, you are the Christ. Now here in what I'm about to read, Jesus is giving the disciples and us some instructions about what that means. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and Take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. I want to read that one more time. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? This is the reading of God's word and God's people did say, Amen. Amen. Each week as I prepare a message, I always, most always write a pretty detailed manuscript. And my custom is that on Sunday morning, I get here early, and I take my manuscript, and I lay it on my desk in my office and pray over it. This morning, I did that, as, as is my custom for years. I did that, and as I was sitting there, I wrote this on the top of my manuscript. And you can raise your hand if you agree with me. I wrote this on the top of my manuscript. It's a really hard time to be a human being in the world right now.
the strife, the confusion, the suffering, the sickness. It feels like we've just run a marathon for 18 months. We just crossed the finish line, and now another race is starting, and people are exhausted and tired. And, and maybe raise your hand if you agree with this too. It occurs to me that it's really a hard time to be a human being in the world when everyone is absolutely convinced that they are right. <laughs> when I prepared the sermon this week, I, I was just really just almost feeling overwhelmed by so many things that are happening in the world, the suffering. And the reality is for most of us, we are in some sense secure from the suffering that other people endure. Could you imagine living in Afghanistan today? Hopefully none of us have a family member or loved one in the hospital today from the Delta variant. And I, I write this message realizing and understanding and believing that the church has such significant value in the world, that the church is needed and that we need the church. And the church that we need is a church that's willing to give up its need to be right. I never heard Jesus say anything about the church needs to be right and needs to, you know, protect its rights. I don't know where we get the idea that, that Christians have to protect their rights because Jesus said, deny your rights, give up your rights, lose your life. I think the church that we need is a church that is more concerned about being kind and loving than it is being right, a church that's willing to suspend its beliefs and its judgments and its convictions in order to truly listen to what's happening in people's lives so that we can respond with what they need rather than what we think that they need. You know what the world needs? It needs a church that's willing to get uncomfortable. When was the last time you were really uncomfortable? Every time I go to the airport, I'm uncomfortable. Airports are really uncomfortable places for me. I mean, think about it. You walk into an airport, and they immediately ask you to empty the contents of your pockets. They immediately ask you to take off your belt, your shoes, you put your hands in the air, you get x-rayed, and then sometimes, randomly, you are searched. Sometimes you get stuck on an airplane in between two people. <laughs> sometimes they're over, overly religious. And you're just, oh, I hope they don't talk to me. I never tell somebody I'm a pastor because it's always uncomfortable for me and for everyone else. But once I was in an airport and I was looking for a place of just solitude and quiet. I like to get there early, find a terminal where no one is seated, read, study, write in a journal, maybe pray, just get quiet, quiet my mind before I go and wherever I'm going. Once I was traveling, went to the airport, got there early and went to the darkest part of the terminal. No one was there. It was basically closed down. There was row after row of empty seats. I sat right in the middle. And when you know it, this woman walks into this my space. And she starts circling around me like this. And I thought, surely she's not going to sit down next to me. All those empty spaces. And she walks in and she sits down right next to me. I couldn't believe it. So I just ignore her. And she starts talking to me. And then finally, when she realizes she can't get my attention, she taps me on the shoulder. I, I promise you. And she says, look at my teeth. <laughs> Who in the world approaches a stranger and opens her mouth and says, look at my teeth? And I thought to myself, why do these things all, always happen? You see, air travel, air travel airports, are meant for misery. <laughs> read this social media post. I just read this recently. Modern air travel is a perfectly honed engine of human misery, 
built to maximize suffering, enhance woes, and guarantee an inexorable descent into madness for everyone taking part in the whole affair. Discomfort, waiting, information withholding, unfair treatment, strip searches, dignity depletion, <laughs> cramped spaces, rudeness, arcane forms and practices, etc. It's all a beautifully engineered tool of hatred meant to exact money from your misery. <laughs> Amen. And on another occasion, one last story. I was in the food court, full of people. A woman walks over to me with her two boys and said, I'll watch your food if you will take my sons to the men's room. <laughs> okay. So I take these two little boys into the men's room, and they're like crazed devils. <laughs> they start punching each other. They're running all over the bathroom. They get in the sink, and they're throwing water on everyone in the bathroom. And they actually get on their hands and knees and start chasing one another under the straws, surprising many occupants. <laughs> somebody, somebody looks at me. I'm not kidding you. says this, says, would you please take control of your sons? And it was really uncomfortable to say, they're not my boys. I don't even know who they are. <laughs> when was the last time you were really uncomfortable? No, I don't mean, you know, being stuck in the middle of a seat on an airplane. I don't mean like, you know, uh, getting on an elevator, going up with someone who likes to talk. I mean, when was the last time that, that you were stretched? When was the last time you were put in an experience where to have that experience required you to think in new ways about the world and about your life? Uh, when was the last time that you had to step out your comfort zone to do something that you knew that you were being called to do and it required something new from you? I don't know why it surprises us because we all know and believe that this is true, that all growth, all growth in every endeavor in life, in the way that we think, the way we live, requires us to be uncomfortable. I mean, think about the way your life began. It began in an uncomfortable way. You were comfortable. You were inside this warm place. You had a food supply 24-7. You could sleep and do whatever you wanted. Next thing you know, your arms, your limbs, your head is being twisted and contorted, and you are slapped. There's screaming. There's crying. And you see these large, tall sticks wearing green, and then you're now laying on top of the person that you were once inside that was carrying you. It's a part of life. Why then, my question then is, why would we believe that following Jesus is supposed to be comfortable? Well, maybe it's because on the outside of our building we put a sign that said, we bring comfort to those who are tired. I mean, Jesus did say that comfort, I bring comfort to those who are tired and needy. It could be because we've been so intent on filling our churches that we forgot that Jesus isn't seeker friendly. It could be that we've turned the gospel into a self-help message of your best life now. Could be. Why is it that we think that following Jesus is supposed to be comfortable when his own life was completely uncomfortable? He left heaven, became a human being, was born in poverty, was placed in a manger. His parents had to flee and become immigrants because they were threatened by a maniacal king who wanted him dead. And then, on his baptism, they didn't throw a party for him, give him cake and give him ice cream and celebrate with his family with balloons. No! God pushed God's son into the desert where there was no cake and no party, just rocks and the devil. And then the tempter came. Notice this. What did the tempter offer him? Comfort food. Turn that rock into bread. And notice what essentially the tempter is saying to him. The tempter is basically saying, Hey, Jesus, if you're really God's son, why is God treating you this way? 
You have all the power of the whole creation at your fingertips. Why not get comfortable and make it all about you? You don't have to suffer. Which leads me to say this. If the only voice that we are hearing in the church is be comfortable, it's all about your comfortable, it may not be Jesus that's talking to us. So maybe what we need to do is, you know, on our exterior wall, we have that uh, sign out there that says, uh, be comfortable. The church is about, you know, comforting people. Maybe we need to find another wall and put that other sign that says, come and die. Because it's this paradox. Our Christian faith is this paradox that, that we have this loving, encouraging, and welcoming God. But he's welcoming, welcoming us to a life of sacrifice and a countercultural life that says, give away your life and you will gain it, not hold on to it, that we're called to servanthood. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, is it any wonder that people are confused because we want to attract people and we say, come and be comfortable with us, and then they walk in and then suddenly we tell them, oh, and you got to love your enemies. Oh, you can't hold them to resentment. Oh, your resources are not your own. You're supposed to give. Oh, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, I didn't know I was signing up for that. I thought it was about my best life now. Must have been what Peter was thinking. Hey, Jesus, that's not the way it's going to happen. No, 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 no. Not at all. Nope. Jesus, we're supposed to it's supposed to be the good life. You're not supposed to suffer. And notice what he says. Get behind me the one that says it's okay to be comfortable. And everything about Peter's life was uncomfortable. From the very moment he met Jesus to the very end of his life. Think about it. The first time that he met Jesus, he invited Jesus to his house. And then thousands of unwanted people showed up for dinner. Friends, if you want to be comfortable, don't invite Jesus to your house for dinner because a whole bunch of people that you don't like are going to come too. Because suddenly you're going to realize this table doesn't belong to you. And then when he opens the table, he opens it to one and all. And it's going to be super duper uncomfortable. I'm convinced that the three most difficult jobs in the world are these three. What do you think they are? Don't tell me. Think about it. Superintendent of public schools. Two, police chief. And third, maybe the most difficult of all, the general manager of a country club. Do you know why? Because when you're the general manager of a country club, everybody there makes more money than you do. When you're general manager of a country club, your job is to make sure that everybody who comes is served and all their needs are met. And your job is to make sure the members of your country club are comfortable. And all the members of the country club all feel like you work directly for them. If you've got 800 members in your country club, well, that certainly means then you have 800 supervisors who will complain about everything from the length of the grass to the amount of chlorine in the pool. Did you know that there's a Christian church, Disciples of Christ Church in Kansas City named Country Club Christian Church? It's actually a great church. It's in a community called Country Club, but it's not a good name for a church. Not really. It gives us the wrong impression. Because, because Jesus isn't our general manager. Th- though he want, He's our Lord and Savior. And he's not here to serve us. We're here to serve him. And why would we think that if we show up to do anything with Jesus that we're going to be comfortable? If you show up on Sunday morning and you're comfortable then you're not hearing from Jesus. Worship isn't about you. It's about the Creator God. We gather to offer our lives to God, not to be entertained. 
The church that we need is a church where everyone is loved, everyone is welcomed, everyone is encouraged, but everyone's uncomfortable. Because if following Jesus is comfortable, then it's probably not Jesus that we're following. We're probably following someone else. What does that mean? This is what it means to me. If we want to be the church in the world, if we want to be the church that we are called to be or that we say that we are, we're going to have to be willing to enter into some uncomfortable conversations. We're going to have to leave our bubbles of security and safety. We live in little bubbles. And if we're going to be able to offer a meaningful answer to the world and bring the gospel to the world, instead of telling the world what it needs, we've got to be willing to listen, what they, listen to what they need. And that means suspending my political viewpoints. That means suspending my opinions and my beliefs to truly listen to someone. If we're going to be a church that we say that we are, that welcomes a diversity of thought and opinion, it means that we're going to have to be comfortable having real conversations about hard things because I'm not confident in any other organization on the earth to bring good news to the world other than the church. Because look at the world, it looks like we're sinning ourselves to death. But I, I, I may not have full confidence in the church, but I have full confidence in the way of Jesus. And if we're going to live the way of Jesus, we're going to have to give up the need to be right and really listen. And then when we listen, we're going to have to be uncomfortable enough to be stretched to serve. And it's so countercultural because the American dream is you earn your living and then you retire and you get a gold watch. But Moses never got a gold watch. Moses was called by God at midlife and he served all the way to the day that he died. And he had light in his eyes. You may be older and you may have stiff limbs and you may not see so good and maybe your hearing's not great, but you can always be stretched. You can always be growing because the moment you give up being stretched and grown is the moment that your death begins. So last week I was honestly just feeling pretty discouraged about some things. I mean, who isn't, Right? It's hard time to be a human being in the world. And I was sitting in this sanctuary kind of complaining about it all. And then I remembered something. I remembered that Martin, Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, was leading a reformation in the middle of the plague where 60% of the population died. In 1527, the plague came to Wittenberg, and when it did, everyone left town, except Martin and his wife, Catherine. They urged him to leave, but he didn't. But instead, they opened their home to their community. And, and sitting in here, I didn't have a St. Francis experience where I heard a voice from the cross. That doesn't happen to me. But I did hear something inside, and it was this. David... If you wait until you're comfortable and the world's in good shape to start doing the stuff that you're called to do, you're going to be waiting the rest of your life because it's never going to be normal again. If you keep waiting until normal returns or to the Delta variant is gone or things are settled in other parts of the world or people and Republicans, Democrats start getting along together, if you keep waiting for all those things to change to be the person that you're called to be or the church that's being called to be, you're going to be waiting for the rest of your life. David, just be the person you're being called to be. Be faithful where you are. And ask your church if they're willing to be just a little bit, maybe a whole lot, uncomfortable.
Surely Christ's call will unsettle us, stretch us. It's the paradox of our faith that our work in this world, in Christ's name, is undergirded by the joy of His love for us, His life and work which sustain us. And so as we go out into the world, we first gather here at table where Christ shares that love and presence with us. I invite you to celebrate that this day. For we remember that Christ was gathered with those that He loved. And He took the bread and He blessed it and He broke it. And He gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Eat it and remember me. In a similar manner, he took the cup after supper and giving thanks for it, he passed it among them and said, Drink of it, all of you, for this cup. It's a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. So as often as you gather, eat of the bread and drink of the cup and do so in my name. For these sacred gifts, let us give thanks to God in prayer. Holy God, as we come to this table... Help us understand what these emblems truly mean for us. Earlier today, we prayed for you to forgive our debts. This table represents your forgiveness of those debts. It's a sacrifice we should strive to earn. It's the next request in your prayer that we struggle with, that we're uncomfortable with, as we forgive our debtors. We pray for the strength, the wisdom, the compassion, to forgive our debtors as you have forgiven us and be the church we need. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, it is Christ who is host at this table and all are invited to participate in this sacred meal. As you do so, I pray that you will come to know the very presence of Christ, the one who suffers beside us. And to that, God, thanks and praise be.
In our society and even in our church, we have a tendency to say, here's how I'll help. Here's what I can do for you. It's a very business and consumer-centered mentality. Here's what we have to offer. But what Christ tells us, you know, the Jesus we say we follow, what he tells us is that we offer ourselves in service. How can I be of help? How can I serve? What do you need? Not, here's what needs fixing and here is how I will fix it for you. But how can I be of service to you? How can I offer myself in the ways that are most needed? When we bring our offerings, when we pass the trays, when we bring our gifts online, when we leave them at the back of the sanctuary, we invite you to place your tangible offerings, sign and symbol of the gifts we bring and the work we do and what empowers the work we do together. But we also ask you to place your connection cards in those same collection places, in trays and online and in collection bins because our presence and our prayers are offerings too. These are also ways that we serve, ways that we say, how can I be of service to the one who created me, to the one who calls me, and to the only one I serve? May our gifts be received. Gracious God, for these gifts that you have first offered to us and which we now return to you, we give you thanks and praise. Make us mindful of the ways, not that we can do things to fix the world, but ways that we can serve you and your people in your world. With grace and thanksgiving, with mercy and wonder, we offer this prayer. Amen.
The song I just sang may have lyrics that sound familiar to them or to you. They're the prayer of St. Francis. I think that prayer is so faithful because it asks us to make a move from hatred to love, from sorrow to joy, from darkness to light, to rather than seek love, to, to love outwardly, rather than our own understanding, to understand the world around us. That is the invitation we have as disciples to move away from a self-centered worldview to a Christ-like one that looks to be a servant to the world and to show God's love. It takes a community to do that, to invite us into loving accountability, and I'm thankful for the ways that this church has done that. I hope that you found your way into this community so that we can be about that work together. If today you're looking for a place to, to do that work, we would invite you to make this your home, of course, you can meet me in front of the, the communion table as we sing together. But remember that we all have that calling to give of ourselves so that the world may know Christ. Now let us sing of our faith once more. seated for just a second. I want to introduce you to Wanda Adams. And Wanda, you're coming here uh, from here. You've been here a year now, uh, and so I'm glad that you've taken this step forward to really uh, claim in a public way the way that this has been a church home for you. And we're grateful for the ways that you've been engaged. But we stand up here in a long tradition, searching all the way back to the first disciples where Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And so here at Harvard Avenue Christian Church, we ask it in this way. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? And in honoring that profession, commit to ministry here in our community and around the world. If so, please say, I do. Thank you. And friends, would you stand and affirm our faith as well? In Christ's name, we welcome you to Harvard Avenue Christian Church. We reaffirm our faith and recommit ourselves to ministry here in our community and around the world. As we learn and serve, we encourage each other's faithfulness that we might be loved, believe, and become together, living with gratitude the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, another welcome for Wanda. I'm going to have you go with Pastor Courtney and uh, make your way out and we all are getting ready to make our way out we know that Christ's call will stretch us in some uncomfortable ways so as we go let us go forth in prayer Christ it is our prayer this day that in the toil and the sweat and the service in your name that we might learn who you are and what you were about for we know that you have done the same for us we give thanks and praise in your name. 
Amen.